There's no such thing as a throwaway child. Children often don't come forward to say, I'm being exploited, I'm being trafficked, because they're afraid. A lot of times the victims don't even see that they're a victim. Be able to track down a trafficker, identify them, find the evidence, build a case, that's a huge part of why we do what we do. Every day, young people in our state are sexually exploited, some as young as eight years old. Rather than judging these victims, we must recognize them as who they are, vulnerable children who need our help. In this video, we'll give you tips on how to approach and communicate with victims and where to find immediate resources to keep them safe. The first step is to recognize the problem. Identifying a sex trafficking situation begins with assessing the scene. Knowing what to look for and what to ask are key components to your investigation. Remember that victims don't easily give up information. We as police are good at doing investigations and we're good at kicking in doors and we're good at following leads and we're good at stopping cars and doing all the things that we need to do but it's it's the the part of connection that sometimes we struggle with a little bit and that's no more apparent than in our interactions in dealing with juvenile victims of sex trafficking. Look for the red flags in every situation, especially those involving young people. Start with your observations. Does the victim avoid eye contact or have any physical bruises? Consider her acquaintances. Is there a significantly older boyfriend with her? Note that interactions with the victim may be vague or inconsistent. And check for specific possessions such as large amounts of cash, prepaid visa cards, or sex paraphernalia. Take the opportunity to ask the possible victim plenty of questions, like where does she live and has anyone hurt her? Your overall approach is extremely important. Because of the manipulation and trauma she has endured, the victim is likely to be uncooperative or even hostile. Listen, be respectful, and gain her trust. You're never going to know what they've been through as a lot, most law enforcement officers are not gonna know what they've been through as victims, but you have to realize what they've been through and sympathize what they've been through. And part of that is, you know, like the, the tip of giving their cell phone number, that builds this trust. And once you can build that trust and the first time they call you and you answer their phone, the trust continues. They might be in a situation at the time where maybe they reacted right away and kind of said, hey, I need help, but might go back later and renege on what they're saying. So you need to understand that like, sometimes it will take more than one or two tries for them to kind of escape the situation they're in. Law enforcement, too, has to get certain information in a certain amount of time. I mean, that's just the nature of the beast they work with, you know? But they have to realize, and they might have to look at their own policies and their own procedures and see how they can slow that information gathering thing down a little bit and try not to rush it up because they have got to trust you before they get deep into that issue. Building a case is all about the details, whether the victim cooperates or not. Record as many details as you can. Make sure to note the identity, demeanor, and statements of every person present. Check every person's ID and interview each person separately. Ask questions like, who rented the hotel room? Who drove the car? Where was each person sitting in the car? There are some specific questions that officers can ask when they suspect that there might be human trafficking. All kinds of things from whether that person has identification on them, whether that person is free to leave, you know, where they're going. If in a situation she makes or earns any money, does she have access to it? Does she control it? You know, all kinds of things to look at the scope of that relationship and see what's really happening. It's also important to take lots of photos at the scene of items such as credit cards, front and back, vehicles, phones, sex paraphernalia, victims and suspects, and any physical injuries. Cell phones provide valuable evidence. Identify the owner of each phone and password if possible. Google the phone number to find links to sex ads. Upon arrest, power off and recover the phone. Also be sure to recover credit cards, lingerie, and other evidence at the scene. Always put the victim at the center of any investigation, no matter how long it takes to build the case. Things that may not seem relevant at first blush, but you know, 
When you talk to the girl in the car, how does she respond? Does it appear as if her answers may be coached? Is she able to answer your questions freely? There's so many details like that that can work their way into your report that are going to help us down the road um, you know, put all of those pieces together. Keep in mind that it may take multiple interviews and there isn't always a magic question to ask. Most important is that you be patient and focus on the victim's needs. One of the challenges with these cases uh, is that they do take both quite a while to put together to oppose the trafficker, but also takes quite a while for victims to disengage from being with the trafficker. And so these are very difficult cases. They take a while and they require just a lot of, of effort on the part of victims who have to sacrifice a lot of themselves to be able to participate in this. For Caitlin, growing up in northern Wisconsin meant years of finding her own way with little adult guidance. She battled depression, ADD, and drug addiction. In search of a better life, she moved to the Twin Cities at age 18 with no resources. I became a stripper. That's kind of where everything else went downhill from there. Caitlin's life changed rapidly once she moved in with the man who became her trafficker. My intention was never to stay. And then a month later, I found out I was pregnant with his child. And during that time, he had a friend who paid him for me to go have sex with him. After I had my daughter, everything just got so much worse. He started hitting me more, choking, and then he put me to work again. Putting her to work meant forcing her to get involved with her trafficker's business that had expanded to include his other family members. It was Caitlin's job to place ads online and take care of the kids. At one point, Caitlin called law enforcement and thought her nightmare was over. Her trafficker went to jail temporarily and she found herself alone on the streets with her daughter. Finally, I couldn't, I didn't know how to feed her. I couldn't buy diapers. So I did sign me up. We filled out a temporary custody. We just brought it out. What transpired next was a nightmare of court battles that ended up in Caitlin losing custody of her child. Then, her trafficker and his relatives were arrested, and Caitlin was contacted by Sergeant Ray Ganey. It was a relief because I had never told anybody my story. And after that, I kept in contact. Um, he helped me try and find where, I, where my daughter was. He gave me numbers to call, and he was just extremely, extremely helpful. Caitlin's testimony against her trafficker's family helped to put them behind bars for some of the longest sex trafficking sentences ever handed down in our state. As for Caitlin, she's close to getting her daughter back, has permanent housing, a new job, and a whole new outlook on life. Proud of myself, got on my feet. I'm not letting him destroy me anymore. I'm worth something. <laughs> Minnesota continues to serve as an example to other states around the country. Along with law enforcement, our state has a team of systems professionals, including human services, child protection, and medical professionals, that have all united to take on the issues surrounding sex trafficking in our community. Minnesota is the first state to dedicate state resources, state funding, to this problem and to set up a whole system to try to deal with this. Um, and, and also, I think the fact that we're taking a, a health model and a multidisciplinary model, this is not just something that's for law enforcement or for advocates um, or for any particular group. We're really working all together, and that's a, that's a new thing, uh, and I don't know that any other state is doing that. The state of Minnesota made large steps forward in the last handful of years because so many people were involved in it on so many different levels, uh, policymakers, uh, to help us get some of the laws changed uh, and the sentencing uh, structures changed. Um, uh, people training, uh, lodging industry training, the people that work in that area to identify this and, and help law enforcement. Uh, those are the things that I think were the biggest steps forward for Minnesota. But we have to work as a team or we will not be successful. And we need to look at how do we educate our children within all of our communities about exploitation, about trafficking, about telling an adult that we will not judge them, we will help them.
Minnesota's innovative approach to sex trafficking was cemented with the passage of the Safe Harbor Law. A child who is being trafficked may no longer be arrested or charged with prostitution. Instead, the child is directed to the child protection system. I'm feeling very positive about where we're at. I think we've really managed to have a quick and succinct response to um, some of the um, pieces of Safe Harbor. And um, I think it's, it's you know, really surprising too, given that this is not just a metro-centered focus approach but really take into consideration Minnesota as a whole and really kind of make sure that people are connected. Safe Harbor means more than legal changes. The law also established a system of regional navigators in the Department of Health to connect victims with services and a statewide hotline provides up-to-date information on shelter availability. The most crucial concern is to ensure the safety of the victim and connect her with services whether or not she discloses she's been trafficked. It's really important that we put bad guys away. I, I agree with that completely. But I don't think that's where officers should start the conversation. The conversation has to be through the, the worldview and the lens that this is an abused child. And so how we talk to you and, and give you some dignity, um, that's really important. One of the first considerations should be, how do I build rapport? What's this kid need? What do I have to offer them, aside from just the fact that I have authority and I'm a police officer and I can effectively make them do what I tell them to do? This has to be a relationship that's based on some sort of a mutual understanding and give and take. When encountering a potential victim of sex trafficking, take a thorough report. The details you record could make a big difference down the line. Connect victims with services. Your regional navigator can help and report underage victims to child protection. Any child who is being prostituted must be reported, regardless of the identity of the exploiter. The same tools we use to identify traffickers should be used to identify buyers as well. Buying sex with a child is a felony in Minnesota. We will never end this horrible crime unless we also focus on the demand holding men who buy people for sex accountable and changing the way we raise our boys. I think we have to start very young to teach boys different things, but men have to step up for that. It can't be just women who are doing this work, as it so often is. I think there are good men who are beginning to lead this fight. It's a social issue that you could talk about, societal norms and, and what what should we expect of men and boys uh, and men to teach boys as they grow up about what's, what's normal behavior, what's not. Our work to connect with victims and hold traffickers and buyers accountable can be very challenging, but it is a necessary and rewarding part of combating sex trafficking in Minnesota. The biggest thing um, is the educating your community members, um, educating your professionals in your communities, um, educating yourself if you have some people in your community that you're suspecting is possibly a victim you know either researching it or reaching out to um, a professional in your community a law enforcement um, sitting and talking with them and going over the information that makes you believe that this is occurring that's the the biggest thing is educating and understanding what trafficking is i always felt that uh, the rush that you get from the investigation uh, and building up to that arrest is, is important. It kind of keeps you motivated to keep doing that. But at the same time, uh, the satisfaction you get when you see somebody that was being victimized in the past that has now moved on to a better part in their life, they're in a better place, and they're on the right path to, to being productive and being healthy. And uh, that's you know, a great sense of satisfaction as well. I feel really positive. I've had, in the last several years, I've had the opportunity to travel all over the country and talk to, talk to police from a variety of different agencies and I feel very proud of the work that's been done in Minnesota around this issue. We can honestly say that we have a statewide collaboration that is committed to the safety of victims. Sex trafficking is a crime that's hidden in plain sight. It's our job to expose it and put the criminals behind bars. Every action we take makes a difference. Nobody should be bought or sold. Sex trafficking is something that damages you for life. You can heal some of the scars, but they're always there forever. There will always be vulnerable women and children, and there will always be traffickers who are willing to sell those 
women and children, but until men stop buying, this will never end. And now I become a mother, a lover, a friend, a co-worker, and I'm motivated to help bring an end to sex trafficking.